All right, everyone, we should get started. Um, welcome, my name is Vlad Perdue. I'm the director of the Klaus Center for the Study of Constitutional Democracy. I'm here at Boston College and the professor of constitutional law in the law school. My role um, this afternoon is purely ceremonial um, to extend to you a very warm welcome um, to the Klaus Center, to Boston College, and to the Conference on Electoral Integrity and Constitutional Democracy in Latin America. Um, I would first like to deeply uh, thank Daniel Aurosa, who is the organizer of the conference, um, a visiting scholar at the law school and a, the director of the Latin America Constitutionalism programs at the Klaus Center. We are, um, if we are doing lots of events on Latin America this semester, it is because of Daniela's vision um, and her um, intellectual strategy um, in positioning centers such as ours. Um, toward the very significant developments um, in Latin America. There are, I believe, around 11 elections in Latin America um, this and next year. Um, and the question of electoral integrity is, is, is profoundly important. Um, there are the cycles um, in, the, in, the, in the life of constitutional democracies about sort of paying attention and interpreting the meaning of elections um, and then, of course, once constitutional orders come under the kind of pressure that we have seen them um, come over the past few years, um, then everything becomes extraordinarily important. Um, and we'll be discussing some of the topics of great importance, of great urgency in the conference uh, today and tomorrow. We'll be discussing questions about transparency. We'll be discussing questions about um, financing of campaigns. We'll be discussing questions about sort of the broad ways in which um, the, the theory and, and theoretical thought about constitutional democracy shapes the way we think about elections. Um, I will end here and I will turn it to Daniela um, for some introductory remarks and for um, introducing our, um, our distinguished keynote speaker. Um, and again, a very warm welcome. Um, and I very much look forward to two days of, of, of great dialogue. Thank you. Thank you so much, for Professor Perdue, for uh, the welcoming remarks. Um, let's start with the schedule of the event. And in that sense, we are honored to begin with the opening conference by Professor Pippa Norris. Professor Norris is the ARC Laureate Fellow and Professor of Government and International Relations at the University of Sydney, the Paul F. McGuire Lecturer in Comparative Politics and at the John F. Kennedy School of Government, Harvard University, and the Director of the Electoral Integrity Project established in 2012 at Sydney and Harvard Universities. She served as Vice President of the APSA. Her major honors include the Johannes Kite Prize, the Carl Deutsch Prize, the Kathleen Fitzpatrick Australian Laureate, the Sir Isaiah Berlin Lifetime Achievement Award, the Fellowship of the American Academy of Arts and Science, the Brown Medal for Democracy, and honorary doctorates from Edinburgh and Warwick amongst other prizes and books award. She has also published around 50 books, many of them translated into dozens of languages. She has served as the Director of Democratic Governance at the United Nations Development Program in New York and on the executive of APSA, IPSA, and the PSA, and as consult of the United Nations, IDEA, UNESCO, the Council of Europe, NED and UNDP. She holds a BA in political and philosophy from Warwick University and master's and doctoral degrees in politics from London School of Economics. Professor Norris will be lecturing today about electoral integrity as an essential condition of constitutional democracy. How to improve the electoral integrity 
and avoid electoral failures in Latin America. So please join me to welcome Professor Pipanores. Thank you so much, Daniela, for the kind invitation and cloth and BC. It's always nice to come over. So this is a topic obviously close to my heart, and it's one which can be applied in countries around the world. It's a global problem, not just a problem which is here in Latin America. And so what I'd like to do is cover why these are the challenges. And first, let's look a little bit at the context, what's been happening to democracy. And elections are clearly at the heart of any sort of constitutional or liberal democracy. They're essential to every per person's vision of a democracy. So if elections go wrong, whatever the problem, that's likely to undermine how we see broader aspects of how the institutions work, whether it's Congress, whether it's the executive, whether it's rule of law and justice, whether it's issues of human rights. Then I'll talk about the methods that we're going to use to evaluate how the elections uh, are held. And obviously there are many ways of doing that. We have wonderful work by the OAS and our colleagues who are focused on uh, electoral um, ob observation. That's important. But we're using a new study, a survey of experts, to see how the elections work in different countries around the world. And we've done this since 2012. I'll show you the key results, both globally and within the region, and then analyze, so what are the real problems? Is it, for example, violence? Is it campaign funding? Is it the media and fake news? Is it issues about how the electoral management body works? And we can pinpoint in different countries what the problems are, and that's really important to think about the potential solutions and the reforms. And I'll mention some further resources. So let's start with the context. What's been going on? Well, like many countries around the world, what we can see is clearly a resurgence of third wave democracies. Basically, as we know, since the 70s, with the changes in Mediterranean Europe, the 80s, with the dramatic improvement in liberal democracy. These are the indications from VDEM, which is one of the best sources we now have to monitor the quality of democracy around the world. And one can obviously see from this, from the early 80s, advances, whether we're talking about Uruguay, whether we're talking about uh, Chile, whether we're talking about Brazil. More recently, however, as you can also see, is that there are some indications in particular countries of a decline, of an erosion, of backsliding. Most evident, of course, in Venezuela, one of the longest standing democracies in Latin America, which has gone down progressively, first under Chavez and then under Maduro. But we can also see in Nicaragua, again, the problems which have, uh, have been emerging and the issues which are there in Bolivia, the issues which are there in Mexico, the issues which are there in many other places. Now, we can't yet say that there's a complete pushback. There hasn't been. We shouldn't exaggerate. There's a lot of work talking about the crisis, which in some ways is premature, and it varies from one place to another. But we can certainly say that liberal democracy or constitutional democracy is under threat and there are underlying signs that things are not well in the world in many Latin American countries, along with, obviously, countries worldwide. Think about the developments in Hungary and Poland. Think about the developments which have been going on in, 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 um, even in the United States and Europe. So is it the problem of elections? So again, we can look at some evidence by different countries over time. And this goes on from 1981, I've selected from the VDEM, they have a measure called clean elections, made up of lots of different aspects. It's kind of free and fair elections. That's how you might think about it. And again, as we can see, has been progress in the long term. We should not exaggerate. But again, look at Nicaragua, look at Mexico, the problems of violence, the problems of malpractices, the problems of clientelism and corruption, um, and even uh, countries that were doing quite well in more recent years seem to have had something of a downturn. So. How do we understand what the problems are and what's the basis of these problems? So we need to go further. You can't just have an average index. That doesn't really tell you much. And it's certainly not really helpful if you're running, for example, an electoral tribunal. A 100-point index, what does it mean? Where are the problems? If you're working in the OAS, if you're working for UNDP, if you're working for an agency, you need to be able to pinpoint the specifics and mobilize to reform those. So what we did was we created the Perception of Electoral Integrity Index. Um, this project started in 2012, and it's a rolling project. And we do it basically after each election in national elections, parliamentary and presidential, in countries around the world. Now, how do we get to the concept of electoral integrity? So it's not my own personal view. It's not Harvard telling the world what to do, which, of course, would be disastrous. 
And so we have to find a basis. And often theorists will turn to dull because that's our kind of classic go-to. If you're an Americanist, you say, OK, liberal democracy is X, Y, and Z. But again, that doesn't really work when it comes to elections. We need a measure which is authoritative. And so we base it basically on international standards. We look at the human rights framework, just like the Carter Center does, and just like electoral observers do. So we think about what's happened in the international commitments, in the treaties, in the agreements, in the guidelines which are being produced. And all of those are authoritative. So when you go to a country and you say, those are the criteria for our experts, it has a legitimacy which is much bigger than if it was my view or any individual view or a theorist that nobody uh, outside of academic work is actually that familiar with. And the most important thing about our notion is it's very comprehensive. It's all stages of the cycle. So again, when we think, why does an election go wrong? We often turn first to the ballot box and polling day, and we look at threats or intimidation or uh, multiple voting or electoral officials having corruption, etc. But the problems can be there miles before that. They can occur in the electoral law, which can be unfair to opposition candidates or restrict who can stand for parties. Or they might be there in campaign funding. And is there a level playing field? And Steve Levitsky has done a lot of work on that. So what we think of is there's an 11-step electoral cycle. And it's the laws. And it's also all sorts of other issues which occur throughout the period of the campaign. And any one of these can fail. And you can think of it, and again, Andreas Schedler wrote about this some time ago when he talked about this with a kind of five-step cycle. We've expanded it. So any one of these can go wrong, and it varies from country to country. In some cases, it may be a lack of effective electoral officials. I'd argue in the United States, that's a large part of the problem, that everything's decentralized, and it moves along. I'm sorry about that. My little machine is doing its own thing, even when I don't do it, it's got a ghost inside it. Uh, anyway. um, so it can be any of these stages which fail. But which fail depends on the particular context, particular country. So you need a comprehensive set of indicators to really understand which of those stages. So how do we know which of these are strong or which are weak in different countries? So what we do is we have an expert survey. Now, expert survey have become flavor to show. Uh, everybody's using them. And they're of different quality. VDEM, the Varieties of Democracy Project, is based on an expert survey. So you could argue it's Freedom House. So is the Corruption Index. So what we did was we developed our own, and we cover all national parliamentary and presidential elections, except very micro-states. Micro-states, you can't really get enough experts, but nevertheless, and everywhere else. And it's an ongoing thing. So for example, a month after Tuesday in America, in the United States, we're going to have an election to look at the Midwest, sorry, uh, mid midterm elections. And we've got experts in each state that will be evaluating how it worked in their own state. So in general, our latest release of the Perception of Electoral Integrity Index, it comes out every six months, is based on a range of different experts, 3,500 cumulatively, and we're covering 310 elections around the world. So in some countries, we've got three or four elections. In other countries, we've only got a couple, depending on timing. And then we also can do this and break it down in large federal states. In New Mexico, for example, we broke it down with our partners so that we can also look at how things work in different places as we looked in Russia as well, and as we looked in the United States. All the data is available publicly, so any PhD student, anybody who wants to run it, can get the data. We believe in total transparency and making sure the data is available. So there's a younger generation of scholars who are using this all the time now. Uh, we try to make it as user-friendly as we can. So who are our experts? One of the questions, just to give you the background. And we tend to find people who are scholars, who are academics, who are somewhat independent, therefore, of the um, engagement, but who are based both nationally and internationally. We try and have half and half, and therefore we want to make sure some people are living in that country, but some people are people who are experts who have written on it. And we look at and we vet all of our experts on an individual basis, and we try and get 40 per country. Now, this is the sort of questions that we're asking. So we've got 50 questions in our core questionnaire, and there are agree disagree questions on each stage of the cycle. So we ask people, after the last election in your country, in Mexico, in the United States, in Britain, wherever, were electoral, law, electoral law, laws were unfair to smaller parties? Agree, disagree. Elections were well managed. Some citizens were not listed on register, etc., etc. So they're not requiring a great deal of expertise in terms of technicality. They're evaluations. They're performance indicators. And that's an important distinction 
between the legal scholar who might look at the actual law and what we're looking at, which is really about practices. How did the law operate according to the experts? So what do we find? So first, here's our map. And this is the map worldwide. And it shows you the overall index when I add up my 50 items into a 100-point measure of the perception. And it's aggregated across all the elections we've held during that period, 2012 to mid-2018. And as you can see, it's traffic lights. So of course, the greens are the ones which we evaluate overall as being the highest in integrity. And it goes down to the red, which are the crisis points. And some countries, of course, haven't yet been covered. Either they don't have elections, about five countries around the world, most of the Gulf states, or elections have been suspended. For example, Thailand has recently, recently, a couple of years ago, it suspended its elections and so on. So before I go further, this is what the pattern looks like. And you can look at Latin America in comparison with many other regions of the world. And as you can see, where are the greatest problems? It's Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa in particular, as you might expect, countries which are often the poorest, which have got problems in terms of liberal democracies and human rights, and where we also have cases of tremendous violence, such as the DRC. And so in those cases, there's a problem. In the Middle East, there's often a problem, as you might expect. In the MENA region, stupid machine, stay put. Um, but we can also see that countries around the world vary a lot. So how does Latin America do? Well, not that badly. Central America, clearly problems. Latin America, um, not that badly, according to our overall index. Doesn't mean to say, though, that when you go down to specific problems that you can't identify weaknesses or say maybe there are things that could be improved. Whether, again, it's the prevention of violence and uh, 130 people who were killed in the last Mexican elections, whether it's issues of corruption and vote buying in certain countries, whether it's issues of electoral management capacity or campaign media, and of course fake news, which is now sweeping the continent. As everybody knows, we, we used to have propaganda in the past, now we call it fake news, uh, and that's moving around through WhatsApp and so on. So the map is useful, but let's break it down. And in particular, what I'd like to highlight is that we as often assume, or it is often, no, let's put it this way, it is often assumed that the United States somehow is a democracy for many, many years, you'd have thought, and yet surely they've got their elections right by now, they've had enough time to practice. And this shows you the rank on the electoral integrity across all of the Americas. And as you can see in red, the United States is really not doing well. And all democracies worldwide, in my survey, they are the worst in terms of electoral integrity. And I just have a brand new book, which we just got out this week, Electoral Integrity in America, so I can do a little ad for that. Um, <laughs> and we look at all the problems which are going on, whether it's gerrymandering, which of course started in our own fair city of Cambridge uh, by Mr. Gerrymander, or whether it's issues of campaign funding, which are out of control and dark money, or whether it's issues of state laws, which are very restrictive, or whether it's issues of uh, electronic machines, which are still running Windows 2000. I mean, there are so many problems going on in, in the United States. Nevertheless, if you also look, what you can see is that some countries are, of course, still doing very well overall. Costa Rica, Uruguay, they always come out well in most of my studies. And you know, they are the Norways of, of Latin America. Um, and then we go down and we have problems, of course, in a country like Haiti, in Nicaragua, which is increasingly problematic, but also in other countries that you can see at the bottom. So overall, middle, middle ranking, you can argue, doing better than the United States, that's good news. And by the way, I should tell that to all our, American, our, our North American colleagues because they really don't like to hear that uh, and it kind of wakes them up a bit. Um, but nevertheless, they're in across countries in terms of how things are going. So let's look at it in a bit more detail. And this shows you everybody ranked around the world. And again, we've got traffic light colors. So you can look at a region and you can say, for example, Europe, all of them are kind of coded green, but they vary. The United Kingdom is doing badly in, the Uni in Europe. Um, my own country, of that was anyway, and um, we can also see in Central and Eastern Europe tremendous variations in the overall score. Estonia, Lithuania, small countries, new democracies, countries which after all only came about with freedom through the end of the Co um, Cold War era, doing well. And yet, many countries, as we can also see, uh, absolute author authoritarian countries with one person strongman rule, and all sorts of problems in how that vote process is done and how the elections are conducted. So just look at the second column, and that's the Americas. And again, as I emphasized earlier, some countries doing well, 
overall, some countries doing badly. So how do we break that down? Well, first we can look at the relationship with liberal democracy. And this shows you the relationship is very strong, just as you would imagine. As I said earlier, elections are the heart of any democracy. If elections go wrong, lots of other things will. The opposition party will, not, will be un unduly penalised. There will be protests, there will be demonstrations, there will be lack of legitimacy in the Congress. And we find systematically that where the public believes that the election is not, um, has gone badly, is fraudulent or is manipulated, or there are malpractices, then often the confidence declines in those core elected institutions, in parties, in parliaments, in many other agencies as well. So countries with have got effective elections are likely to be liberal democracies, but of course it's not sufficient. You need so many other institutions to work as well, and you can have many other problems arising, even if the elections are great. And an example, a topical example of that, I think, is Brazil. In the last election, um, as Jose said just before we, we as we were talking, uh, the outcome is problematic in all sorts of ways for human rights and for what's going to happen to the country by the election of an authoritarian populist. And yet, the election itself, while it had problems, wasn't that bad um, in terms of the actual quality of how it was conducted, or levels of turnout, or participation, or many other indicators. So, you can have an election which is high quality, and yet the democracy is problematic. And particularly, for example, a case like Benin or Ghana, um, where the uh, elections are good, but many other institutions are weak. They have no state capacity, so that's, a, that's an issue. And you can have a country which has the opposite. In other words, the democracy is reasonably good, but the election went wrong for all sorts of reasons. Um, and so the two aren't totally hand in hand, but again, we can see that there's a strong relationship between the two. And a Venezuela increasingly degenerating in terms of authoritarian populism over a 30-year period under successive leaders is fundamentally problematic for both. And they, inter they interact, of course where the elections are manipulated it allows particularly authoritarian populist leaders to be able to re be returned to power and to make sure that the opposition does not have a level playing field for their own contests. Well, what about other ways to explain it? Is it economic development? And here what you can see is that it's not so much economic development. So again, you can have an election which is high quality or low quality, but what you've got here is per capita GDP is a standard measure of economic development, and you can see that, in fact, countries are right across the line. So you've got a Costa Rica, which is roughly the same amount of uh, per capita income as, for example, in Argentina or Venezuela, but the quality of the election is much greater. So again, when you get a failed state like Haiti, because of the problems and the, the natural disasters and then the difficulties in governance and the lack of capacity, and it's so poor, that's a problem for any election. Of course, how do you run an election in that context? But it's not simply levels of development or modernization, to use that kind of cliche, which is really critical. Once you get past a certain minimal level of development, then you can have a good election. The problem is whether there's the political will and whether there's the structure and whether there's the institutions to actually run an election effectively. So let's break it down a little further. And as I said, we've got 50 questions, and each of those for the 11 different steps of the electoral cycle, so we can rank them. And what we've got here is the red, which is how they rank on average in Latin America to identify the weakest stage of the electoral cycle. And then in grey is the global average for all the other countries around the world. And if you look at that, it's pretty obvious what's going on. And again, many, many people will say it's the <coughs> final stages. But in fact, a high rate in here is where it's positive. And you can see that things like the vote count is pretty positive in the region and okay. elsewhere. And also we can see that the uh, results, the announcement of the results without delays, and the role of the Electoral Congress or Tribunal comes out pretty good. So what's the problem? Well, number one, political finance. And this is not news to the OES, and it's not news to anybody in the region. Both directly through vote buying, indirectly through clientelistic actions, where particular material goods are promised in return for votes, and also general levels of corruption that undermine confidence and trust and the whole working. And again, Brazil, the problem was really corruption in general and the sense of how that delegitimized parties as much as the specific problems in that contest itself. And again, if you look across the results, the other major area of weakness, media. 
And that's interesting in the sense that this is, in a sense, um, before we were so focused on fake news, the problems are really about a level playing field in all types of media, in, in state television, in, in public television, and in commercial television, and in newspapers, as well as in WhatsApp, as well as in Twitter and the, uh, and social media, and Facebook, and all the rest of it. And those are two areas, by the way, which the international community has been very reluctant to intervene on, and they're areas which are highly controversial when it comes to any sort of regulation, because you immediately come up against First Amendment, and the idea is that the state should not be intervening. So we've got lots of NGOs who are working in these fields to try and promote independent journalism, and to try and have fact-checking, investigative journalism, and to try and make sure that we can think about problems like foreign interference in elections, which is, of course, not just Russia. Now that we've discovered this, it's also China, and it's also Iran, and it's many other countries are starting to use simple, cheap techniques outside of that country in order to set up fake accounts and in order to really um, change the nature of the campaign. So money and media are the two biggest challenges, not that the others are perfect by any means, and you can also see that there are some other issues where, again, there could be improvement, for example, laws and the legal framework, and that could be improved in a variety of ways. And to give you a simple example of that, countries which have majoritarian electoral systems, by and large, are far worse in their electoral integrity and average, even in established democracies, than are countries which have more proportional systems. The reason is quite simple, if you have a majoritarian system, for example, a single member district like in the United States, far more incentives for gerrymandering, far more incentives for vote buying and other forms of, of direct um, clientelism. If you live in a country where you've got a large region you're voting for, those kind of problems are much more difficult to implement. So there's a natural incentive, if you like, in those rules to prevent those problems, not that other problems can't emerge as, as a result of that. So, here, I'll just give you two more slides and then we'll open it up for Q&A and think about the broader questions. Here's how the world looks for the two problems I've mentioned, campaign funding, major issue, and look at how Latin America is doing there. Much, much worse than in the overall pattern, as you can see, and particular countries uh, where uh, the use of state resources is abused and the media is limited. And one of the first things that authoritarian populists do is push back on freedom of speech in every country. It's been one of the greatest declines around the world is in free speech. You can look at the Committee of Journalists, you can look at the Human Rights Watch reports, you can look at reports by the, um, the, electro, sorry, the um, European uh, sorry, the Economist Dem uh, Democracy Index, and they all show that freedom of speech has really been suffering, whether it's in Turkey or Hungary, or whether it's in Venezuela or in the United States. The fact that we haven't had violence against journalists in America is so far purely luck, I think, more than judgment in terms of where we're going in the United States. That's a little personal aside. Um, and campaign media and campaign funding are problematic. And again, you can see media is slightly better in Latin America overall than the, than the funding side. But nevertheless, it's not good. And we can see how the problems compare in countries around the world. So, Oh, uh, sorry, you can also break it down by particular issues on particular countries. So if you want to use this data, and you're interested in Venezuela, or you're interested in Mexico, or you're interested in Guatemala, or Haiti, or whatever, you can pull it down, it's in Excel amongst other things, and you can say, let's look at all the different stages, and how strong are they compared with the global average, or the Latin American average, or whatever it is. So it's a really useful resource to really then pin down what's happening through each of these stages. So the conclusions, and then we can open it up for Q&A. There are major challenges, and they cut across our conventional distinctions. It's not simply developing countries, it's also there in post-industrial, it's there in countries which have been long-standing long democracies, as well as countries which are newer democracies. It's particularly there in electoral authoritarianism, because that's how they rule, that's the first thing they do, is they get there through elections, and then they erode other democratic institutions like freedom of the press, like the judicial independence, by packing courts, such as the Supreme Court, and by, by focusing on attacking their critics, and particularly marginalizing the democratic rules. If you read, for example, Levitsky and Zimblatt's book, How Democracies Die, they really emphasize it's the informal democratic norms which give way. They often do so because the election allowed 
party or a leader to come to power who was then able to have that sort of impact. So if we can somehow fix the elections, it might be one of the major ways that we can try to prevent authoritarian populism taking over. When it's already taken over, it's then very difficult to push it back. So if you can think of it like a blockage in the system, a safeguard in the system, if we can get elections right, it might be that it helps with many other problems which we're now encountering. And again, in the United States, if we had elections that were effective, legitimate, free and fair, they didn't have problems with money, they didn't have problems with violence, they didn't have problems of gerrymandering. If we didn't have an electoral college in America, we wouldn't have had Donald Trump as president. <laughs> to put it very simply. And there are new challenges. We can't just think about the old challenges we're familiar with for the last 20, 30 years. We've got problems of cybersecurity, which have arisen and where people are increasingly effective at hacking into systems. And so some of the countries which have moved ahead with computer technology for elections are actually the most vulnerable now, particularly if they're linked to the internet versus their own systems. Problems of social media, misinformation and fake news. And again, propaganda is nothing new. You know, we've had studies in the 1940s and 50s on propaganda, but the way in which it's now gone mainstream and the media bubbles, the segmentation in how we get media, means that it is particularly virulent and we have really totally inadequate protections against that. We are always, in a sense, running behind where the actual developments are in that. And so that's a big area for new reforms. And then the growth of um, violence against politicians. We've always had violence against individuals, but again, through, whether it's through drug cartels or whether it's through opposition violence or whether it's intercommunal conflict, there are lots of different ways it happens. And of course, particular groups we're starting to research on, as Mona will talk about later, the challenges for women in intimidation and threats, also coming through social media, as well as overt acts of violence against them. And of course, the problems of authoritarian populist parties, who are very intolerant, who are creating party polarization. And the real problem with that is that when a problem emerges in an election, in the early years, it used to be that we kind of think of it as a technical problem. So for example, on Tuesday, if a voting machine goes wrong in Massachusetts, we used to think, oh, it's a voting machine gone wrong in Massachusetts, or a delayed opening of a polling station, or um, you know, a vote machine in Texas, which is reported you vote for one candidate, it actually shows the other. If you've got a tolerance and an acceptance of the rules of the game in a democratic culture and moderate parties, you can get over that. And you can say, okay, you know, we should fix that, let's get new machines or whatever. If you're polarized and nobody trusts anybody, and there's no, in, no tolerance, and divisive politics and tribal politics rules, then any threat to the legitimacy of the election is going to delegitimize the outcome, and that means that you're going to have a contentious politics, and it ratchets everything up even worse than it was before. And authoritarian populists already get support by saying, don't trust the political institutions, certainly don't trust Congress, it's, it's corrupt, don't trust the judiciary, they're partisan. Don't trust uh, politicians in general. And so if the elections go wrong and, it's in, and, they make, um, and, and parties are polarized, there's no way you can get over either, either technical problems. So we need effective electoral assistance. Now the good news, so you don't sound so depressed, is that electoral assistance has really moved substantially in the last 20 years and has now become a lot more professional. We know how to do a lot more things. We've got better standards, whether it's electoral observing and the work which they do, which is invaluable, or whether it's work on how the electoral management bodies work, or any of the other technical aspects of elections. We know better how to do it, but uh, the money in the electoral assistance, unfortunately, international development aid is being reduced in the last couple of years. We had a big expansion in the 2002 to 2010, but now it's gone down, not just in the US State Department, but also in Europe by many bilateral donors. So our resources are squeezed, and the political problems, I think, are again running ahead of our technical knowledge, because we've got new problems that are coming onto the agenda where we have no idea what to do. So all of this risks flaws in the elections, which means lack of public trust, which means it, that those groups are more likely to vote authoritarian populists, so it's a vicious cycle. Now, are there resources? If you're interested in finding out more, there are. Firstly, we did just do a report, well, just do a report, on um, the role of the OES called Democratic Diffusion, 
available in Spanish and in English from the OAS, which looked at the impact of electoral observer missions. That was part of our research in our project. And then we've also got a lot of other books, pamphlets, research reports, um, articles. So for example, Checkbook Elections is about eight different countries around the world, including Brazil, and how they uh, regulate um, campaign funding, and does it work or not, including India, including South Africa, as well as Sweden, as well as the United States. We have books on does electoral integrity matter? We have books on electoral contention and violence, and we have studies which are there in many different areas. And this is our website, electrointegrityproject.com, and you're very welcome to go there to pull down anything about us, our fellowships, our, our publications, our reports, our projects, our events. And we've been creating basically a network which is worldwide, which is bringing together younger scholars for whom this is the critical issue. And they know that they can't take elections for granted, and they need to understand them, and they need to find the impact, and they need to find the ways to reform them. So lots of people in lots of countries who are doing their PhDs and postdocs are taking this agenda forward. And again, it's amazing that like 20 years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, um, everybody was studying elections and nobody was studying their problems. I mean, we kind of thought they worked. We thought that, you know, voting behavior and elections, electoral systems, in enormous literature. Nobody was, everybody was from a Western democracy perspective thinking, they work, what's the problem? Now you have to bring in the normative, you have to bring in the problems, you have to bring in public policy to really understand this. It's a new agenda, but it's really taking off in lots of places, lots of good research, but lots more to be done. So everybody who's here who's still doing work in this area, you know, let's go to the next generation and, and really think how we can fix the elections. Thank you very much, Lenny. Thank you. so much, Professor Norris, for this very interesting lecture. It's really an honor to have you here today. Uh, I think we have a few minutes uh, for some questions and comments. Somebody wants to do one? Yes? Hi. Um, thank you very much. It was a great presentation, Professor Norris. Um, I would like to disagree with the classification of Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, in, in the index of, um, in the columns of the world, it, it's gone along with Bolivia, El Salvador, Belize, Bahamas, Guyana, Paraguay, Suriname, Ecuador as moderate, and um, away from Costa Rica, Uruguay, Canada, Brazil, Peru, Panama, Granada, Colombia. Um, as you know, um, you, you must have uh, known uh, about that uh, famous Vargas Llosa, the, the Nobel laureate uh, dictum in a program with Octavio Paz, where he said, Mexico, the perfect dictatorship, uh, the, la dictadura perfecta. <laughs> that was in around the 70s, something like that. Since then, um, it has worked towards democracy with six constitutional reforms. Um, all consistent at every stage in, in furthering the um, freedom of, of elections, transparency, etc. And we have had alteration in power between the PRI and the PAN twice, then again the PRI, and now recently, for the first time, a left, a center left or left wing uh, party has won Morena with Mr. Andres Lopez Obrador. Mm -hmm. This past election wasn't contested at all by anyone. Uh, it wasn't taken to tribunals, except for the case of Puebla, the governorship, and the municipality in Nuevo León. Otherwise, all the reports coincided from uh, OAS, from United Nations, from all the observers, that it was a, a, the, the tra most transparent free election so I don't understand the criteria from the classification of Mexico. Of course, I am aware about the violence of the drug war. Um, it did have an impact in the election in the sense that some candidates of all different political parties, unfortunately or regrettably, were killed. But that also talks a lot about 
the, the, the cohesion of the system because these people would not allow to be manipulated by the uh, cartels and they sacrificed their life in that. So uh, even considering the context of violence, I don't understand the classification of Mexico in this. Sure. So obviously you're very welcome to look at our evidence and so on. We do rely on our experts and they're giving us a ballpark figure about how they think uh, the election is working. But we also do know when we look in more detail at the Mexican context, that, that the case of violence was just so dramatic. 130 politicians and party workers killed is the most recent estimate that I've seen. And that's a major challenge. And that does not, in, that does not obviously include the intimidation or the threats or a variety of other factors that are going on behind the scenes which lead to those overt cases. So you have that kind of level of violence in Afghanistan, you have that level of violence in Assyria, you don't normally have that in any other Latin American country which I know of with that number of candidates. So that's one issue. And then also we remember the cases of uh, previous elections. And remember what we've got here is the average across all of those years, 2012, 2018. So I remember quite vividly a couple of, year, couple of elections where we had real problems of vote buying and issues in Mexico, tremendous protests of that. As I recall, there were certain plastic um, credit cards for shops that were given out, which were a small amount, 50 bucks or whatever, for food purchases and so on. So again, clientelism and vote buying is not just us. Other people have looked at it in Latin America and found it a general problem. Uh, but it was there in that, that contest as well. So I think what we'd need to do is really look at the data and see what the issues were. And just like we broke it down for Venezuela, look in the Mexican case at how different elections have different strengths and weaknesses. And it's, as you say, it's not a bad score for Mexico. Uh, it's just not a higher score, perhaps, than you might have, might have expected. And I totally agree that in terms of other aspects, the shift in 2000 and then the subsequent changes have been ones which clearly show that Mexico, Mexican elections and the role of the electoral authority I've got the greatest respect for. And I've visited them and seen what they do. For example, I very much admire the way that they, they actually produce the party political broadcasts for all the parties. I think that's a thing that other countries could learn from it as well. But still, there are problems just as there are in, in the United States. Um, so let's, let's look at the data and see what the experts say. And uh, the July, by the way, the July e elections, um, I haven't looked at the most recent set of expert assessments, so it'd be interesting to see whether those are better or worse over time than the previous elections. Uh, but again, we can look at that as, as evidence. Fortunately, we are having the presence invited here uh, by the school, well, by the college, of Mr. Lorenzo uh, Cordova, the president yeah. of the National Electoral Institute. That's he right. will be paneling tomorrow. That's and right. maybe if we could uh, dialogue and comment about this. Absolutely. Ask him how he felt it went, compared with previous contests, for example. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Okay. Good, good, good. Thank you. Let's see. Yeah? Yes. <coughs> Question, Maris. Looking at the difference uh, between public and private funding. Uh, is there any evidence that any of those uh, have better performance in electoral maturity? So, so that's always a great issue. How do you actually think about campaign regulations and so on? So what we do is we have a kind of fourfold four model about how campaign funding might be thought of. One is what you might term a free market, which was kind of the way which, in particular, the United States often thought about it that we want minimal amounts of state uh, regulation and there should be basically whoever has the resources should just be able to spend the money. And this was a very traditional view. A second view, a second kind of option is you want to have transparency of donors and you want to make sure that where donors are giving resources that that's basically out there. But of course, as in the FEC, uh, the, uh, the body in the United States, you can have fairly decent transparency records and that's happened ever since 1974 when they reformed things after the Watergate scandals. But there are dark money still, and that's increased due to the Supreme Court in terms of where the money comes from. And by the way, the Democrats have also got a tremendous amount of dark money. That was on the New York Times just recently. And it doesn't change the inequalities of who gets money. And again, there was a recent report in the United States election right now in Congress that women are still behind in fundraising. So transparency is often thought about as an effective solution, but it's a limited solution. A third solution is public funding, and this is often in, in Europe, where the parties who are in Parliament or in Congress get a certain proportion of funding depending on their number of votes or seats, and that's retrospective, etc. That's more egalitarian, it's more of a level playing field, but it's also a cartel, because it means if you're out and you're a new party and you didn't get elected or you're a new candidate, 
then you, you won't necessarily qualify for those resources. So it basically says incumbents are going to get the benefits, but not outsiders, green parties or whatever, small parties. And then you can basically think about combining all of those things uh, by law. But what we found is that in the most heavily regulated, funnily enough, there are real contradictions. So you might well have lots of laws regulating how much you can spend, how much airtime you have, how much the public funding you have, um, how much there's, uh, there's good accountant systems at the end of it, etc., etc. And in practice, none of this works. And the case is Russia, which has beautiful laws in the books. None of them work. And then you can have another country which has got almost no regulation whatever and where the parties just... They're thought of as kind of... Um, voluntary associations, it's kind of a traditional view, right? And they raise what they want and they spend what they want and nothing much is on the books and yet there's very little abuse and this is Sweden. So informal norms are often as critical unfortunately as the legal framework, which is real disappointing for all legal scholars in the room. Um, but but it, So it's a really complicated issue to regulate and when you say what are the international standards on campaign funding, uh, almost none. Because Europe doesn't agree with the United States, and, and the world doesn't agree on how we should regulate campaign funding, mm. and so it's one of the areas that really needs a lot of work to think through what we can do. And it's not so much, you know, where the, where the money comes from, it's more like how it's being spent. Mm. And the most effective is normally to make sure there are subsidies and ways in which members of Congress and political candidates get access to their citizens, which they should. They should have forms of communication, obviously, in any campaign, without being too restrictive, but without allowing money to have an enormous advantage such that it's either used, it abused through illegal mechanisms, or it's used legally, but is still so much um, a lack of a playing, a, play, a steady, I mean, a level playing field that um, the incumbents are gonna get in no matter what. At uh, least in terms of monitoring uh, where the money comes from and where it's being spent. Right. Uh, usually there is this assumption that uh, in public funding systems you can track the money more easily because the state is the one providing it. Well, yes. In you the, are that? No. Uh, so again, unfortunately, this, these are our case studies which are so disappointing for everybody who believes in these reforms. So India, uh, what they did was they passed a law which kept down the amount of money that candidates can spend and parties can spend and gave them public funding. Trouble was, it was too low. And so every single candidate and politician basically spends black money to get elected because you can't do that in the size of the constituencies and in the, in the kind of media context in India, they say. So what you're really doing is regulating it, by, but your laws are so bad or ineffective that you're making everything illegal. Um, so it's kind of the unintended effects of bad regulation can be, can be problematic. And the same can be true even, again, of the United States. Transparency is one thing. But of course, by having more transparency, you can also make people more cynical, because you see how much is being spent. You, see, you saw how much is being spent um, in Texas, um, was it, I hate to say it, 30, 30 million, billion? I always forget which it was, but anyway, it's an enormous amount, um, by just one candidate who's probably likely not to get through. And so if you publicize transparency too much without other forms of accountability or other forms of access, then it's a problem. And you know, just the last word is, money is the problem of whack-a-mole, as we call it, which is you regulate one thing and something else pops up. And no matter what you do, you try and do this and then something else happens. And it's a really complex issue to try and regulate effectively. It's true. Um, Carmen, yeah? Thank you, Professor Nor. It's very interesting. My dream is to become a dark green Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> once, yes. Once, once. Become a Norway. So, um, I... I always think, and you, you, you mentioned uh, the public trust. Mm. So, how can you ponderate in your, in your, your results and in your model that uh, the permanent public distrust on authorities, on the public issues, on public issues? Yes. So, even if you have an almost perfect election management and a great law and great authorities, people and experts as well, because we can ask experts to, to answer these, these questionnaires and, and, and questions, but 
there's always distrust on politics. And well, that's, that's the, the permanent question I always ask to this kind of studies, how to ponder it. It's mm -hmm. very valuable, Absolutely. but how to ponder it. And the other thing, how to ponder it under a comparative perspective. Different, um, uh, the same actions that are different or have different consequences in different countries. Gerrymandering. Mm -hmm. Gerrymandering in Mexico is like killing someone. It's the worst thing that could happen in Mexico. We eradicated that. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. And we put lots of money for the uh, territorial uh, boundaries, oh. electoral boundaries. So it's one of the most controlled activities and transparent activities in the country. So to do a gerrymandering, it's like going to hell the minute after. And here it's normal. It's normal. No? Absolutely. So how do you ponder this kind of, of, of uh, right. uh, evaluation of this kind of conducts? So you've got different problems in different countries with different priorities. That's why you have to break it down to those 11 steps and further. Because again, you can't say that it's only this issue, uh, it isn't. Um, you often take for granted the problems in your country as being somehow universal, uh, but they're clearly not. Mm -hmm. And we can learn from the countries which have managed to eradicate gerrymandering. For example, right now on the ballot, we have five states which are, are putting in independent commissions through referendum. And the idea is maybe we can get out of the politicians being the people who are setting the boundaries, which to my mind is utterly inappropriate. It is the Turkeys voting for Christmas business. Of course, they're going to vote for their own interests. If you bring in independent commissions, which how you get there is another matter, but California's done it, then of course you can get over some of those problems. And as we know, in, again in the US, the Democrats in the House are going to have to have something like an eight to 10 point lead in the vote in order to get control of the House. Not 50-50, eight point lead. And the, the imbalance in the Senate is far worse because rural districts are overcompensated and therefore uh, the population, which is about a third of the public, lives in rural areas, and they're totally overcompensated through the Senate. So even when you don't have gerrymandering, you still have district problems, which mm -hmm. are partisan, which is difficult to address. Coming back to your first issue of trust. So we've got a new project which we're starting, which says that the problem we've got to think about is trust and trustworthiness. So in some countries, you have very trustworthy institutions that work and they, things are impartial and the officials are professional and the standards are high and any problems in the judiciary are clearly looked through and the public doesn't trust them. And so that's a major problem which is basically about cynicism. And for example, in the United States, again to quote a figure, um, in the Gallup poll, world poll, 10 years ago, 60% uh, of, uh, uh, of Americans said yes, they could thought their election was honest. Today the figure is 30%. It's gone down, it's about the same as Russia. So a problem where um, the public is not trusting or trustworthiness is a problem, but also there is actually the opposite problem, which is that you can have a system where the public trusts it and it's totally untrustworthy. Uh, and so you've also got to think about some of the worst countries in the world where there's strong propaganda control, censorship of the media, and limits of critics, <coughs> uh, you know, the Belarus of the world, and 90% are turning out and 90% are voting for the party and the leader in uh, Lukashenko, but the election is totally rigged, and people don't realize that. And so what you've got to get is a match between the trustworthiness and the trust. And either of those problems is a problem for democracy. You don't want to have too many cynics, and authoritarian populists are happy to throw, um, throw problems where they say that the elections are fake or fraudulent or problematic, even when they aren't. And you don't want to have the problem of people being, having faith in their elections when, in fact, they're problematic. Um, and again, that's a marvellous device to keep people under because then they don't even criticise the way that the system, the system works. Um, and our new project is hopefully going to monitor both of these aspects on a range of different institutions. So some criteria of trustworthiness, and we argue there's benevolent and malevolent kind of institutions, and then, some trust, then an indication of the public who are trusting or, or cynical, and then we should be able to see what the relationship is between the two. But normally when we talk about trust, we never think about trustworthiness. It's a really important problem. You shouldn't trust those who are untrustworthy. It's like a kid trusting a stranger, right? Mm -hmm. That's dangerous. But it's also dangerous if, the, if, you, if you don't trust a trustworthy person like a doctor, because then you don't have <coughs> So it's an interesting issue. Yes, too. Uh, Professor Barros. Yeah. 
two, two brief questions. One has to do with the, with the methodology. Yes. Uh, there may be no better mechanism than to rely on expert perception. Uh, but I was curious as to what methodological limitations do you see on that reliance? And the other question is, why is it that in, that in your in your metrics, a structural system bias against small bodies is a is an integrity problem. One might hypothesize that control of small bodies might be essential in the long term for the stability of constitutional liberal democracies. So you, you cut there the political views that are at the margins of the mainstream of constitutional commitment, the liberal democratic commitment. So what were the reasons for thinking of small party uh, bias uh, as an uh, integrity problem? So let's think of those two. Methodology. I mean, it'd be great if we could think about other indicators. And we always try and triangulate. So we use our survey, and then we look, for example, at VDEM, who have a similar operation in Gothenburg, and we say, are our results comparable to their results? So they have clean elections, we have BEI. You do find there's a strong correlation. Now, it could be a hall of mirrors effect, because the air experts might read our reports, and we might read their kind of conclusions, and we might all be living in a... And particularly, there might be path dependency where we, we're not quite up to date. So we have, an, particularly internationals, you have an impression of a country, and it's rather like the corruption index. It's often a bit out of date. If a country's made tremendous changes, they've still got this image. And so they're still stuck at the bottom or whatever, or they might be at the top. So um, we need other methods. And clearly, we use mass surveys. So I'm also, with my other hat on, part of the World Value Survey. And with Latin America, with Marty Lagos, and with LAPOP, with all the work which um, Bob, uh, Mitch Seligson does at Vanderbilt. Those are brilliant resources. But of course, the public might be wrong, as the experts are wrong, but we can compare. What's the comparison between those two? And then you can also think of uh, quote unquote objective indicators. And so we have, for example, the Pew Performance Indicator in America, in the States, which is based on things like uh, length of queue times, um, line, you know, standing in line to wait times, and, and the various other things like turnout, um, and, and so on. Problem is that many of those quote unquote objective indicators are actually quite difficult to interpret. For example, you can have high turnout or low turnout in a particular district or country for all sorts of reasons beyond whether or not the election was well run. It could just be there's a lot of competition, or like in Cambridge, there's no competition, right? So you've got lots of factors affecting your objective indicators. We also have surveys of the electoral management bodies and their staff. And that's another interesting thing which is developing. There's an election management group which is trying to do that in lots of different countries. Um, and I think particularly if you get to the lower level officials and ask them how they, how they thought it was run, that's great. And then you've also, of course, got electoral observer reports that you always will try and triangulate. What was reported in that country? Is the indicator in your data supported in, in that as well? And then you can do a case study. So I think there's no single method in any of these things. We try and do a method which is sufficiently disaggregated to allow a bit of nuance and also global to allow comparisons. But you obviously need to pick it up and take with it and then do lots of other things as well and interview people and do qualitative research and etc. Um, so it's like the perception of corruption index. We can't measure corruption. There is no way you can do it objectively. You can look at cases in law, which are, which are being um, prosecutions, but you don't know what that means. It could be the more prosecutions, the less corruption, or the more prosecutions, you know, etc. So it can be upside down. So again, it's a new field. As I said earlier, we're, we're starting to get good indicators, which we can look at. And the more that we get, again, the, the World Value Survey, for example, we put, we put it in in the last wave, and we're doing it again this time, 2017 to 19. So we've asked 10 questions for the public. And we can then say to the public, how do you think about the quality of the elections on X, Y, and Z? And I hope that's going to be included also in a number of um, national election surveys. So again, we can ask people themselves, for example, did you feel a threat as you went to the polling station? They're the best people who know. So again, using lots of sources is the best way of doing this. No single source. I never believe one, one data point. I do believe it when you've got a kind of cluster, and you've done it once, you've done it twice, the internationals and the nationals agree. We do also have robustness tests, and we have things like, does the characteristics of the expert affect their judgment? For example, is national and international difference? Or if you're um, well-educated or not, or X, Y, and Z, if you're in one part of the state versus another. 
So we try and explore the data through our experts. And we use more experts than anybody else in most of this. And we um, also basically have a better, we think, vetting process for our experts. So all of those things go into it. But it isn't like a mass survey where you've got a method which is accepted. Expert surveys are being done all the time, but nobody has set out any sort of sampling procedure because it isn't a sample, right? So you haven't got confidence intervals, which means you haven't got... So small differences don't matter, basically, is the simplest way of doing that. Um, but bigger differences, which are robust, which happen every, every election in that country, those I put my money on. Okay. Well, just to add two points. One follows on uh, what Dr. Lee just said about the challenge of maintaining uh, in a timely manner the sense of where a particular country is in the indices. It struck me um, in some of the work that we have been doing here at the law school that the index for Uzbekistan might soon be out of date. I noticed that it was at the bottom. Um, and I sense that I look forward to seeing how that might um, change a bit over time. Yes. Um, and hopefully, by the way, when we, again, when we accumulate, you can see what goes, what's getting better, what's getting worse uh, in the same election, same contest. But, and again, we can do that beautifully when it's at state level. So say the state changes its law, it's perfect before and after. I mean, it's really nice. So they change the hours at which they open polling stations, or they change the, the restrictions on voter ID, or a hundred other things. And what we're going to be able to do is look at the, using the Brennan Center classification of a lot of different voting facilities, and using our data in 2014, 2016, 2018, and it's like a natural experiment. It's, it's, it's not quite natural, but it is an experiment. The second uh, piece I wanted to ask is your impressions on uh, criticism that's uh, been prevalent here in the United States about the length of the typical American campaign. Oh, absolutely. And how cyber uh, issues have impacted the distorted effect that the length of these campaigns have had. That's right. It seems that cybersecurity has worked the end game the last 48 hours Yes, I mean, the trouble is that it's rather like trying to put the genie back in the bottle because so many countries have now moved to the permanent campaign. Uh, America is just nuts, though, in terms of there was a great, art, a great <coughs> study years ago by Anthony King who said it has, it's the country that has the most frequent elections because you can't avoid having a primary or a, a, a congressional election or uh, the beginning of the general election and presidential election, etc. And in all of that case, basically, America has more elections than almost any country around the world. Some countries have elections every three years, that's Australia. Most have them every four or every five. And when you have an election, for example, in the United Kingdom, it is the election. I mean, you obviously have European elections and local elections, but nevertheless, it's the general election. And so everything's there. So one of the reasons why turnout is so low in America, in the United States, is simply that um, we have very, very frequent elections, lots of demand, and that leads to basically voter getting fatigue in terms of how often they're asked to participate. So the length of the campaign is part of this. And then one wants to think about a variety of factors. It's not just the timing of the campaign, but also the information environment and the choices on the ballot. And again, I just voted in Massachusetts um, because I got an advance vote, right? Great big long thing. And most of it was only one party, as we said, so it could have been living in Cuba for that matter. Um, and, you know, I did my little round blob on, on all these guys who I hadn't heard of at all, but I knew what the party was. And no information was provided. There was no standard. I couldn't go to a website to find standard state information with a 100-point you know, statement of all, all candidates with a photo or anything about their background. So you're voting in the dark. And then, of course, local, local lead media has also gone down, so your information environment is pretty low, except at the top of the ticket, where you do get debates. So we have uniquely numbers of elections, unique number of officers who are being elected, and a very complex information environment, and the net result is a big skew towards who votes, which is largely the educated. Mm. Um, so there are lots of things about the structure of American elections that we kind of take for granted here, but you don't take them for granted in other countries. Um, and a, 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 a simpler information environment, a parliamentary system where you get clear cues about where the parties are for five years, one big election where they normally would come together, it just makes it easier for people to take part. And then PR, of course, so your vote isn't wasted, and you get up to the 80% turnouts that you get in many Scandinavian countries or in, in Europe, etc. Um, 
I, I mean, there's, oh, they don't, don't get me started on the number of reforms which there can be for American elections. Instead, have a look at that. Look at that. Look at that. <laughs> for a number of things that we can. Okay. Well, um, Dr. Comley? Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you very much for this presentation. I have two, two questions. One is regarding the indicators for electoral authorities. I mean, I, I didn't get invited to the panel, so I was looking at the, the panel on electoral authorities. So I, my, is my thinking, I mean, I'm, the question I have is, do you feel that the indicators uh, are, that you have in your survey are sufficient or enough, enough to really uh, grasp the role and, and the, you know, the, what the, the function and the perception of the of the electoral authorities, because I mean they are ingrained in almost every aspect of of the electoral process. However, there are like four indicators. One of I mean three at the belonging to that the you know the eleventh category and one in electoral procedure. So uh, that's one question. So, and secondly, I was really very surprised when I saw the first uh, iterations of the of the integrity project that included Cuba. Yes. And I just yes. saw in yeah, the yeah. last one that he was no longer in Cuba, included. Right. But I, so I wanted to hear your, what was the thought process first to include Cuba and now to exclude? That's right. And don't forget North Korea. That was also highly controversial. Mm -hmm. that. Yeah. And North Korea as well. Yes. That's right. <laughs> so on, on the EMBs, I mean, obviously we'd love to have a lot more. The trouble is you've got all these dimensions and so how do you do that? I mean essentially what you need is more of a detailed post-election survey which could evaluate just the EMBs and all of its roles which needs to be disaggregated because local officials might differ to national figures and provinces and states, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So there's a tremendous amount that can be done. And I think the work of the electoral management group which has started, which is Polly and Garnet, uh, Toby James and others, it's really starting to get to grips with that. And work, which is very well at MIT, by Charles Stewart III and a number of other colleagues, and something called the Electoral Sciences Group, who's a group of political scientists who are, are, are very much interested in electoral administration. And electoral administration has been a major issue, but of course it might not be actually the problem in many other countries. It does depend on the context of where, it, where, it's, where it's run. So I totally agree we need more, but also you can't exhaust your poor old experts by having so much on one topic versus all the other problems which are, which are going to exist. Um, Cuba and North Korea, so we've gone back and forth on that. And in particular, we thought about, should we have a cutoff for having uh, only one-party states, essentially? Trouble is that you can look at whether or not there are other parties by law, and you can also think about other aspects of the election. So we're not founding our, our basic concept of election, electoral integrity on democracy. Others do, we don't. We're looking at electoral integrity, which we believe is distinct, it's closely related, but it's not the same thing. And there are many countries where other parties can compete, or other candidates can compete, but in practice, there are many, so, so many restrictions on them that they can't get that percentage of votes. So again, a Belarus where you, know, you get an opposition candidate and they get 5% of the vote, that seems to me as much as problematic. And so you can think about, do we need a cutoff? For example, a predominant party, we're only going to do it in the countries which don't have a predominant party with, say, 70% of the vote. But then you're also cutting off a whole bunch of other countries. So the cutoffs that you use are very sensitive to the measures that you're thinking through. And we believe that we want it to be as comprehensive as possible and to have as many countries as possible. Also, this is a benchmark. So should Cuba liberalize? in another blah, blah years, then we'd have a way to say what's been the change at the time, etc. cetera. Um, same is true of North Korea and, and other countries around the world. So we wanted to be inclusive. What we then looked at, however, was that, in fact, the number of experts that we have, particularly in authoritarian states, is the most problematic, mainly because nobody studies elections in these countries, so we don't have many domestic experts. It is often within law versus political science or any, any other field. And we found that the number of experts willing to respond was, was too small. So we eventually dropped those, those two cases, along with one other where we had not enough respondents. Um, but in, in, in theory, we'd like to have more respondents, but finding people who are really experts in the Azerbaijans, etc., is, is really difficult to do. Um, and, and so we, we are limited in, in what we can do. But we want, to include, we want to be inclusive so long as the country's over 100,000 per cap, because we still don't have the experts in the, the Nauru's and Palu's and the small island states which are, which are there yeah. as well.
Okay. Um, what? Whoops. Thanks for a very interesting presentation. So my question is about Facebook and oh, yeah. the social media campaigns. And I have read analyses that um, there's, I think, 2 billion users of Facebook monthly and that they can see that it has altered the course of many uh, elections around the world. And that this is a problem that's currently being regulated by people in the Silicon Valley because they have access to their controls and they can sort of really know how to so I just wondered how your um, survey is both going to change in light of this new threat, uh, what kind of questions you propose to your experts, and how you also deal with the problem that this can be very invisible to experts um, unless they can get into the system themselves to see how, how the users uh, are using the information. Yes. So, I mean, the most practical thing was that we, we lost our perception of electric integrity manager who went to work for Facebook. So that was really a disaster. <laughs> um, he's now sitting in, in Menlo Valley in the, in the war room looking at all the problems of electric integrity going on around the world. So then I had to find a new manager. Um, but in, in, in a broader sense, what we did, as well as the 50 questions, what I haven't mentioned is we have a rotating battery. So like other surveys, we want to have both continuity over time in the core and we also want to co cover the kind of topical issues that everybody's most interested in. So in the rotating battery, we put in items on fake news and its effects and a variety of other issues like that that can capture the kind of current issues, cybersecurity threats, um, challenges to, to electoral security and, and things like that that we want to be able to monitor. We'll have those results at the end of 2018, for all of the elections during 2018, and then we'll bring in another uh, rolling battery. It's about 10 questions that we'll add into the next survey for 2019. So we can kind of capture topical issues and then as well as continuity over, over time. And the simple issue, as you, as you know, is that really fake news is everywhere. And therefore, therefore it's, I think it's as much a problem of, for example, Fox television as it is a problem of Facebook and, and other issues. Whether or not it's having an enormous impact on the campaign, I think is still out. But Kathleen Hall Jameson has just given a new book on the topic, and she's the dean of the Annenberg uh, Foundation Center in um, Philadelphia. She's really good, and she's coming up to give a talk on that. I saw in the Shawnstein Center, I think, next week. So our first sort of evidence is starting to emerge, but you really need good experimental data in order to find out the impact of being exposed to one type of message versus another type of message. It's very nitty gritty. In this. We also have a chapter on fake news, which again is starting to have some very good evidence on what's, what's going on and what sort of impact it has. But remember, most of us are getting our messages through so many different me mechanisms. It, pinning down any one source is really very difficult to do. Um, and pinning down the impact of social media, either versus other types of media, is also very difficult to do. For example, I just looked at the Brazilian election. And there's one question in the uh, Dal Roja, is it Dal Roja? Opinion poll, which asks about how you got your, your um, information during the campaign. It was done the 10th of October, not the final, but nevertheless. And so it looked at television, and most people still got their information from television in the Brazilian election. Uh, then there was social media, and then there was WhatsApp. WhatsApp got 4% of the population saying they got a lot of their information from there. Because even if you get it from WhatsApp or Facebook or Twitter, are you actually getting it from there? Or are you getting it from the New York Times that put the article there or the Washington Post or the mainstream media that's also out there? So what is it to see information on social media? It's just not immediately obvious. And I used to work on political communications years ago when I wrote on the digital divide and things like that. And it was just so much easier to do your research when you kind of had your mainstream networks and you can ask people about what they watched and how often they watched it. Nowadays, I don't know that we can do most of these sorts of things effectively, through survey research in particular. If I was to ask everybody in the room, so how much in the 24-hour period do you use um, social media? Well, you know, I, I don't know. I'm, it sends me messages all the time. So all of these things are a lot more complicated to do. And we really need um, multiple methods in order to, to get at these sorts of issues and these sorts of impacts. Um, in, in particular, I do think, by the way, that the emphasis on Russian interference in social media and the impact it had on the election, I think it's an utter exaggeration to say in any way that it shifted a lot of votes one way or the other. What mattered was much more mainstream stuff and what the campaign was putting out and what Fox was showing and then what the New York Times, Washington Post, ABC News, CNN, etc. was showing. That's still the source of most information and social media are often very secondary in any of those 
sorts of processes. Uh, and the mainstream media is equally bad when it comes to fake news, as you will have seen. A, a, a classic example, again, on New York Times front page today, is all about the stuff on George Soros, the excellent founder of the um, Open Society, which has done tremendous work on democracy and throughout Central and Eastern Europe, in Poland, in Hungary, and everywhere you go. And his being labelled as somehow it's a Jewish conspiracy, which is funding the quote-unquote caravan of uh, refugees flooding, in, flooding up through Mexico. And it, it's utter lies, and it's out there in the mainstream, it's there in our leaders, and it's being echoed in our voters, and it's everywhere. But I don't think we can blame social media for that. I think it's in the air. That's true. Well, uh, I think we have time for one more question. Okay. I, I would presume that uh, the ultimate objective of this is a healthy democracy, right? Uh, or a healthy election. Let's not go as far as a healthy democracy. A healthy election. Well, or as a prelude to a healthy, healthy democracy. democracy. So part of a healthy democracy. Right. Now I would presume that uh, a healthy democracy is uh, an interaction between you know, a product of two forces healthy democratic institutions and advanced citizenship. Right? And probably the causation it's probably stronger for the advanced citizenship to the democratic institutions than the other way around. Uh, so my question is when you, when we look at uh, an un unhealthy democracy and we say we want to push it towards healthy outcomes, if we push on the side of democratic institutions without uh, care for the advanced citizenship, how are we sure that we're going to get to a better outcome? So actually, this is what, exactly what I was talking about in my class yesterday on comparative politics, which is the cultural explanation versus the institutional explanation. Mm -hmm. And which do you need? And obviously, you need both. The, the best evidence going on right now when I look at what's been happening in terms of changes in democracy, in liberal democracy in particular, is that the institutions are kind of at a formal level, legal level, of oh. the patterns of who could vote and how the judiciary is appointed and da 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 da. If you look in the, all the different indicators in VDEM, they kind of are okay. It's the soft cultural norms which are eroding. And I think it's not so much eroding amongst the citizens as it is first amongst the elites, amongst the leaders, amongst the parties, amongst the politicians that when they push back and they've refused to accept the give and take and democratic norms which are how these institutions work, then you get the problems which are there both for the, for the legal structures and for the citizens themselves. So I think it's not so much institutions versus cultural citizens at the mass, it's those activists, those leaders, those agencies in between and what messages they're giving people which affect both kind of go, goes both ways, right? So it's kind of a triple-decker rather than a, than a clean sandwich. And when, again, it's authoritarian populist leaders who are both attacking the informal norms because they don't like those rules of the game, and then their voters who are highly polarized through the media and through their own partisanship, and partisanship is the only lens which they're looking at, that's when you get the real fundamental problems happening. Um, and it's not chicken or egg, it's not is it citizens, is it institutions, it's a, this dynamic process between the leaders and the way that the institutions function. Simple institutional changes which have tremendous consequences for how effective they are for democracy, and then the public and what that does to their followers in terms of whether they then have any faith in, in, in democracy as a whole. But this is an enormous agenda. And again, we're still, what, we're, we're still, in the process of starting up another new center, hopefully on eroding democracy and authoritarian resurgence. We're going to be looking at some of these issues. And the simple thing from the current literature is there's lots of people out there saying, a little bit chicken little, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. And they quote Hungary, they quote Venezuela, they quote the cases which are most in the news, and of course Trump dominates everything that we think about. If you look worldwide, it's much more subtle. There are gains as well as losses. We often don't see the gains because they may be a smaller country that's moved forward. Uh, a Nepal, for example, or, or a Benin, or a Ghana, and we are often dominated by the cases of those which go backwards because they're more dramatic, and we're very worried about them. And clearly cases like the UK and the United States, which are sliding, and because there's so much in the news through Brexit and through Trump, are at the center of our attention. So it's more subtle than the big chicken little. Not everything is going down. I try not to use the word <coughs> crisis in my work. At the same time, not all is healthy, as you, as you say, 
And so we need to disaggregate the real causes of those problems. And you can't, by the way, change the culture. When you come to policy, culture is kind of like jello on the wall. It's up there, it's out there. You can't create trust out of trust. You just have to work on the institutions. And those we can reform more effectively. I think the reforms are technically we know about. What we've still got is the political problem of how you implement them, how you get the political will, even to put in the most basic reforms um, when you've got many other interests who are not in favor of it, and you have leaders who are uh, going towards degenerative democracy or, or recession, shall we say. So lots of research to be done. OK. Well, uh, please join me again to say thank you. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much. And uh, well, we will have a very little break before we start with the first panel. Okay, yeah. Four minutes break. No more.